Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to the Church of the Living God Sunday Live. This is Elder Foster coming to you live from Maricopa, Arizona. Thank you for joining us for this Wednesday night Bible class. Let's go ahead and open up with prayer, and then we'll jump into the lesson that we have for today. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for another day. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us. Thank you for strengthening us, leading us, guiding us. And thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Pray, Father, you give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Father, I want to pray that the words that I speak may be encouraging, strengthening, and helpful, and deliver people, and cause them to walk upright in your presence. Forgive us of our trespasses. We forgive those that have trespassed against us. And Father, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. All right, everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Church of the Living God, and thank you all for joining us. We know that you missed us last week, but it was unfortunate I had to work, uh, but thanks be to God that uh, gives us the victory in all things, but uh, we have to do what we have to do. So um, glad to be here tonight, and tonight's lesson is uh, I want to talk to you about the love of God, and I just want to title this, Jesus, I'll Never Forget Your Love, because uh, I want to show you something, because when I think happens with the church is I think that we forget how much God has loved us. We forget how much God has loved us. And quite often as a people of God or just as people in general, we're always looking for what somebody has done for us first before we do anything for them. And a lot of times people either forget or they fail to understand what God has already done for us. The book of Psalm uh, 106 said, if men would praise the Lord for the wonderful works that he's already done. God already done wonderful things for us. He's already done marvelous things for us. He's already done more for us than what we deserve. What a mighty God we serve. Before I jump into that word, let me go ahead and make the announcements I need to make, and then we'll get right into that word uh, with Jesus I'll never forget. Don't forget every Tuesday and Thursday that we have prayer line from 6 p.m. Arizona time to uh, 6 p.m. Arizona time, and it starts at 8 p.m. if you're in the Midwest, and then 9 p.m. if you're on the East Coast. Now, I just want to give you an early reminder, those times will be changing next month as the time changes across the country. Now, Arizona time does not change. So we will stay at 6 o'clock, and your time will fall back. And so we will be appearing uh, once after November. We'll be appearing an hour earlier for your, for, for your location. And I'll remind you of that when that time happens. Then Wednesday night, of course, we have Bible class, 6 o'clock every uh, Arizona time, 8 o'clock if you're in the Midwest, and 9 o'clock in the East Coast. And then every Sunday we, we come live. Uh, I've been trying to stream live from either my house or Clarence's house, um, and that's at 11 o'clock uh, uh, Arizona time, 1 o'clock if you're in the Midwest, and 2 o'clock if you're on the East Coast. All right, don't forget to continue to keep us in prayer, pray for one another. Just pray for me, for my body, for strength, for my voice. Um, got a lot going on these past couple of weeks, and I'm just tired. And I ain't no way to even say it no other way. I'm just tired, but y'all just pray for me because I know that God is able and that he can keep us and that he can uh, lead us forward. Um, and this might, but there's so much to do. That while we're living, we got to get it done. Amen. So praise the Lord. So good to see you all here. Uh, uh, praise the Lord. And thank you all just for your goodness. So if you've been trying to reach me and trying to talk to me, I'm still here. I've just been busy. And I pray that y'all just forgive me. Um, and uh, I'll reach out to you as soon as God uh, give me availability. Amen. All right, let's get into this lesson for the day. Because I'm excited about this because I want to show you something that's in this word. We're talking about the love of God. And I entitled this Jesus I'll Never Forget. Find yourself at the Gospel of John, the third chapter, verses 14 through 18. The Gospel of John, the third chapter, verses 14 through 18. I want to show you something there. So, um, we're, going, we're in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, the third chapter. Now, we, uh, a lot of us, we know this, we quote this a lot, but I just want to take you in a different direction. Because, again, as I mentioned, sometimes we forget just how much God loves us. We forget. And, and, and we think God is being cruel to us because we have to go through hard times. We think God is being cruel to us because things are going on in our life. We think God is being cruel to us because somebody died or being cruel to us because our relationship is not working. He's being cruel to us because we don't have enough money. But, but you're mistaken. 
Because you letting the things that are happening in your life determine the love that God has for you. But I want to show you how to judge the love that God has for you. Find yourself in the Gospel of John. That's the third chapter. And I'm going to read verses 14 through 18. And we find these words. <clears throat> Let me get there myself, saying. Now, uh, now watch this here. John 3, verses 14 through 18. Uh, and the word said, And so, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned. Excuse me. <coughs> Y'all, excuse me. Is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the, begot of the only begotten Son of God. And this is condemnation that light is now coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that the deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought into God. Now, let's talk about what God so loved. I want to go take us back to something. Remember what something that God did. God loved Adam when he made Adam from the very beginning. He made him a son. God had many sons that he made. Hallelujah. Many sons that he made. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. That's the word made, uh, made manifest, became Jesus. The sons of God, which are a type of an angel, God made them. Hallelujah. Adam was made. But of all the sons that he had, Adam was the first son that he made from the dust of the earth. Because he did not make angels from the dust of the earth. He did not make Jesus from the dust of the earth, but he made Adam from the dust of the earth, and he made the dust of the earth in his image and his likeness, and he saw what he had did, and he said, this is very good, and he loved Adam, and he called Adam his son. Hear what the preacher say. He called Adam his son, and he loved Adam, and he gave Adam one commandment. He loved Adam so dearly. He gave Adam one commandment because he loved him. He said, look, there's a lot of trees in this garden, and you can freely eat up all of them except the tree of knowledge and good and evil. God is showing his love. He said, you can freely eat up all of them. And he made Adam upright, and he made man perfect, but Adam fell and started seeking out many other inventions and started sneaking out other ways, and that's what we're doing. But he loved Adam. He loved Adam so much. That the second Adam came as a spirit, and the second Adam was Jesus. And you'll find it in the book of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. He loved Adam so much that he sent Jesus to come to die to save Adam. That's the love of God. And that's what he's talking about in that parable of the prodigal son, and we misunderstand it. We always think that's about us. Oh, the prodigal son came home. We didn't have nothing to come home to. We was never home. We was born lost. Somebody better hear what this preacher say. But when he was talking about the son coming home, he was talking about the return of Adam. Somebody hear what the preacher say. Talking about because Adam took all that he had. Adam left it. And just like in that parable, the father loved his son. And he kept waiting on the road, waiting on the return of his son, Adam. And God is waiting on the return of us. Waiting on Adam's children to come back to him. Waiting on Adam's seed to come onto him. That's the love of God. And please understand it. In that parable, that son had done wrong. The father had done nothing wrong. He was not a bad parenting. He didn't have lack of parenting skill. He was an excellent father. The son chose darkness over his father. He chose the world over his father. So he left everything the father gave him to go pursue his own thing. And the father loved him so much that he looked for him every day and he was willing to accept him. Now hear what I'm going to tell you. He was willing to accept the son after all that he'd been through. He was willing to accept the son after all the laws he had broken. He was willing to accept the son, bring him back in, put him on a robe, put him on a ring, and still make him son. That's love. God shall love the world. That's love. He was willing to redeem Adam and to continue to walk and talk with Adam and to continue to walk and talk with his seed and with his fruit to continue to invite them into his presence. That's the love of God. 
even after the prodigal son took everything from the father and wasted it on harlots and wasted it on riches and wasted it on the cares of the world. The father was standing there. I'll never forget how much God loved us. And when you're walking around, you mad at God because you couldn't keep a car. You mad at God because your house, you got your house got four clothes on. You mad at God because your loved one died. You mad at God because things didn't go the way that you prayed for. Shame on you because you missed the love of God. Those things that happened in your life was the enemy stepping in because the enemy told God you only loving him for naught. But God loved you so much. You had to go back to this gospel of John and read what the apostle was saying. And John, who saw Jesus manifested in the flesh, began to understand the love of God. And I think a lot of times we miss the deep love of God because this was the love of God. The book of Hebrews said, when God could swear by no greater, Hebrews 6 chapter, when he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. What did he swear to? He swore to Abraham that he would save his people. And when he couldn't swear by anything greater, I want y'all to catch what I'm saying. When the angels fell, God did not make a swear. When the sons of God left their natural habitation to sleep with the daughters of man, God made no swear. When Lucifer was found with iniquity in him and he walked against the almighty God, God made no swear. But when Adam, hallelujah, when Adam fell from God's grace, God swore that he would save mankind from his state that he was in. And when he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Where did God swear it? In Genesis, the 12th chapter, as he was talking to Abraham, he said, Surely blessing Abraham, I will bless thee, and cursing, I will curse them that curse thee. And he couldn't swear by anything greater. He swore that the promise he made to Adam would continue in Abraham. He would be fruitful and multiply. And Adam was supposed to be the father of all mankind and Abraham ended up being the father of the redeemed people of God. For God so loved the world. So what you didn't get that car you was praying for? God loved you. And you didn't get that car. Ain't got nothing to do with how much God loved you. You didn't get the car because your finances wasn't together. You didn't get the car because your credit wasn't together. You didn't get the car because you didn't do the things you needed to do to obtain the car. You cannot blame that on the love of God. God loved you and he got you where you needed to go every day. And he fed you every day you was alive. For God so loved the world. But let me show you how much God loved you. Your God loved you so much, he wasn't worried about if you had a 2022 or if you had a 1919, get out and kick it. God loved you so much, he didn't care if you had a brand new home or if you had a tent in the backyard. God loved you so much. What he was concerned about was your soul's condition. He loved you so much because when Adam fell, Adam lost that relationship with God. And God loved you so much, he said, I'm going to go back and get my children. For God so loved the world. And we'll talk about love. God loved the world. He gave something. His only begotten son. Now catch this. And a lot of people misunderstand this. And we don't catch it what it's saying. Because we say, well, God only had one son, Jesus Christ. No. He had many sons. He had one that was begotten. The only son God ever had that was begotten of the flesh, born of the flesh, is Christ manifested in the flesh. Adam was created from the dust of the earth. The sons of God were created from the imagination of God by the hand of God. But Jesus, the word of God, was made flesh and born of a woman and to this world. The only begotten son of God. God loved you so much. I'll never forget the love of God. He loved you so much that he wrapped himself in sinful flesh. That's what the book of Philippians said. And being found in the fashion as a man, in the likeness of man, he humbled himself. He loved you so much, not only did he leave his glory circle throne, he loved you so much 
that he was born of a woman so he can walk in the flesh that you walked in so that he can know that he could redeem you and prove that you could be redeemed. That's the reason Jesus walked in the flesh to show to you that you could be redeemed from your sins. Somebody better hear what this preacher is saying. That's the love of God. Because he didn't want nobody coming back and saying, God, this is too hard to serve you. We were made of flesh. This is too hard to serve you. We live in this world. So he put himself in flesh, made himself lower than the angel. He didn't even make himself angel status. He didn't make himself any status but the status of Adam, his brother that fell. His son that fell, y'all forgive me on that. Made himself as Adam. And he came into this world. And he loved you so much that he was flesh and he walked amongst you. And the book of Gospel of John said in the first chapter and the 12th verse, And to as many as received them, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Before that he said he came unto his own and his own received him not. He was in the world and the world was made by him. The world knew him not. When God put himself in flesh and came down here to the world, the world act just like they didn't know who he was. And God didn't get his feelings all hurt like we do. God didn't get all set like we do. He didn't have an attitude like we do. People forget us. People forget what we've done for them. He stayed in this world. He tabernacled 33 and a half years in the flesh that deteriorated, in flesh that could die, for God so loved the world. Well, tell me God don't love you. He loves you. He loved you so much that he put himself in flesh and allowed man to beat him, allowed man to spit upon him, allowed man to hang him on the cross. I'll never forget that type of love. And he did it because he wanted to save us from the damnation that Adam plunged us into. He told Adam from the beginning what would happen if he failed him, if he sinned against him, he said, Adam, you're going to die. And see, death was more than what Adam could ever imagine or what Adam ever thought because Adam was already created with the, with the, with the mindset that he was to live forever. God had created him with that. He knew he wasn't going to die. He didn't have to worry about a funeral day. He didn't have to worry about getting things done before he reached a certain age because God had created him to live forever. But then Adam stepped into singing. My Lord. And mankind was lost to darkness. And the same thing that God told Adam happened. He said, Adam, the day that you do this, God knew how powerful sin was. He knew how dangerous sin was. He said, Adam, the day that you do it, you're going to die. You're going to die the same day that you did it. And Adam didn't understand. And when Adam saw his years going on, he was 800. When he saw himself at 900, he saw his years going on. He thought, wait a minute, God, I thought I was going to die. And Adam died at 930. He died the same day God created him because he didn't live a thousand years. And sin was so powerful that every man dies in the day that he was born. Y'all better hear what this preacher saying because ain't none of us been a thousand years old. And God loved us so much that he came to redeem us from the curse of death. He loved us so much. The only way to redeem us. Let me show you this. Go to the Gospel of John. The 15th chapter. Uh, I'll read verses. Um, I think I'll read verses 11 through 13. In the Gospel of John. The 15th chapter. Verses 11 through 13. And we'll see what the Lord has to say. <coughs> 15th chapter. Verses 11. Let me go to verse 10. 10 through 15. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm going to read on 10 through 16. If you keep my commandment, you should abide in my love, even as I kept my father's commandment, and I abide in his love. Somebody hear this. If you keep my commandment, and you shall abide in my love, even as I kept my father's commandment, and I abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy, that my joy might be remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love, hear this, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servant, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I've called you friends, for in all things that I have heard of my father, I've made them known unto you. 
You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you should ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you that you love one another. Now watch about the love of God. Watch what God, this is Christ telling this to the disciples. Christ was telling this to the people that were following him. He was talking about his love. He said, if you follow me, if you abide in me, my love will stay in you and God's love will stay in you. Even as he loved me, he'll love you if you just keep my commandment. Watch this here. Mankind that lost what God gave them from the beginning, God has given them another opportunity to get that love back. For God so loved the world. He loved us so much. That the only way to redeem them, because sin was powerful. Sin had a grip. Sin brought death. Sin brought hell. Sin brought disruption. Sin brought destruction. And Adam had no idea what he was bringing on to himself because he was walking in paradise. And when he stepped into sin, he left paradise and he walked into a world without the love of God abiding in it. Hallelujah. God looked and he loved man so much. He said, I got to redeem them from this. Because they don't know the curse that they got upon them. And when you're not walking in God's commandment, you don't know the trouble that you got upon you. You don't keep God's word. When you don't serve him faithfully, you don't know the trouble that's waiting at your door. But God loved you so much. I'm going to show you the greatest love. There's no greater love than that a man laid down his life for his friend. And they didn't even catch what he was saying. And he said, ye are my friends. God just called us friends. Somebody hear what I just said. He called us friends. You have to go back and consider Abraham because God considered Abraham a friend. Do you know what it means for God to consider you a friend? He called Abraham friend. Said, Abraham, you're my friend. God was calling a man of the flesh his friend because Abraham kept his commandment. Abraham believed in him. And God said this. He said, you are my friend. Hallelujah. And then Jesus just told him, you are my friend. But this is how he said to you, my friend. You my friend if you keep my commandment. We are God's friends if we keep his commandment. Do you understand the love that is being shown there, that is magnified here, that God is calling us friends? A friend is someone that you entrust. A friend is someone that you will lay your life down for. A friend is a companion that knows everything about you. And Jesus said, everything the Father told me, I told you. Friend. I'll never forget God's love. That's the reason when I get an opportunity to present this word, I'm excited to present it because I'm telling you things that God told me. And Jesus just said everything the Father told me, I told you. Jesus came down there and started sharing with them everything. Y'all got to catch this. Y'all got to imagine it. Everything that him and the Father talked about before he came on this journey, Jesus came and told the disciples, somebody give God some praise. When he was talking about the kingdom of heaven, him and the father had talked about the kingdom of heaven. When he was talking about redeeming them from sin, him and the father had talked about redeeming them from sin. When he had talked about sin and the power of the Holy Ghost, him and the father had talked about sin and the power of the Holy Ghost. And now Jesus said, you my friend, and everything the father just told me, I'm telling you. I'll never forget how much God loves me. So what if my business plan don't work out? So what if I don't get everything else together? So what if I have some trials and some cruel mockings in this life? So what if I'm not living high on the hall? God loves me. And he proved his love because he gave his life. And we don't understand how powerful that was, how great it was for God to step into flesh so that he could die because he had to prove the greatest love. Oh, I know they sing the song, the greatest love of all is loving yourself. But that ain't what the book said. The book said the greatest love is that a man laid down his life for his friend. And God just proved that he had the greatest love of all time because he gave up his life. Because he called us friend. I hope somebody catching what I'm saying. Wouldn't it be but right? 
for the greatest love to be exemplified by the greatest God, by the almighty God, by the king of kings, by the everlasting, by the wonderful, by the counselor. He showed the greatest love and the world still got it wrong because they think the greatest love. And we tell people all the time, you got to learn to love yourself before you can love somebody else. You got to learn to lay down your life for the ones that you love. That's the greatest love. God said, I love them so much. I'm going to do something for them. They need to be redeemed. He didn't send Gabriel to die. He didn't send Michael to die. He didn't send any of the 10 billion, 1 million angels that he had. He did not send them to die. When it came time to show him the greatest love, he wrapped himself in flesh and died. Somebody hear what the preacher say. I'll never forget the love that God has for us. Let me show you how powerful God's love is. His love is so powerful that his love brought the blood to redeem us. Y'all still with me? Go to Exodus, the 12th chapter, if you will. I want to show you something. Exodus, the 12th chapter. His love was so powerful, he bought the blood. Remember, let's, let's, let's see this here. <coughs> Exodus, the 12th chapter. Let's see what verse I want. Um... Hallelujah. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go Exodus 12 and I'm going to start at verse 21 through, uh, through uh, 28. Exodus 12 chapter 21 and 20. I'm showing y'all something. God loved us so much that it bought blood. That's how much he loved us. Greater love is no man than this, and a man laid down his life for friends. He didn't just die. He shed blood. Because the book of Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. The problem was that when Adam ate of the forbidding fruit, he brought sin into his life. And sin is not something that you step in a bathtub or a shower or a lake and rub it off with some light soap. Sin is not something that you take to the cleaner and you can get the stains out of you. Sin is not something that will come off of any chemical that man uses. The stain of sin could only be removed by the blood of the holy. And all the blood of sacrifices of lambs and ox and bullock and turtle dove could not remove sin. It just covered the sin. Somebody hear what I'm saying? And God loved us so much that when Adam fell, the first thing he did was kill an animal to cover for the blood for the sins of Adam and Eve. Go back and read Genesis. He killed an animal and made clothing for them because of their sin. He had to have blood because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. And then all you people running up to these people in these private booths and you calling them father with the book said, call no little man on earth your father. You have one father which is heavenly father and you telling them all your dark secrets and they making you go do things for your sin. It's not removing your sin. The only way to remove sin is by the blood of Christ. We have forgotten what the blood was for. God loved us so much, he knew the power that the blood had. But it had to be blood of innocence. It had to be blood that had never sinned. And Jesus was in the world. He was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. This is how much love the Father had. He made his son go through every temptation you would go through that you would encounter. He made his son endure every affliction that you would have to endure. But he made him do it and made him come out without sin. Because the blood of Christ would wash away sin. God loved us so much he bought blood. Watch this here. I'm in Exodus, the 12th chapter, verse 21. The Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take your lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you should take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of this house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptian, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door. And I will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house to smite you, and you shall observe this, this thing for an ordinance to those and to thy sons forever. And it's to come to pass when, when you come into your land with the Lord give you according as it promised that you should keep this service. And it's to come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That you should say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the house of the children of Israel and Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered us, delivered the house and the people 
and bowed down and bowed their head and worshiped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded. And Moses and Aaron did so. They did so. They said, now watch this here. This is what God is saying. God was saying, I'm getting ready to come through there. I'm getting, because y'all full of sin. Watch how good God is. He was sending the death angel. And people didn't understand that. The death angel came from God. God was sending the death angel through. There's 10 billion, 1 million angels. Angel, death is an angel. That's his job. I want y'all to catch this. His job is to take. Thing. His job is to make sure that when end of life has expired, his job is to take it. That's all the death angel does is he takes. He don't restore. He don't redeem. He has no compassion. He has no mercy. He don't care for your pleading. He don't care for your crying. He hears not the voice of a brokenhearted mother. He hears not the voice of a trodden down father. He hears not the cry of a child. His job is just to take things. And Adam didn't know about the death angel to the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit. And death could not take note or take care. Wait a minute. This is the first man created on earth. I can't take him. He could not. Wait a minute. He was created in the image and the likeness of God. Wait a minute. God just called him son. Death had a job and death took Adam. And he'd been taking man ever since. And God loved us so much that death became an enemy. But wait a minute, God. You created the death angel. God said, I create all things. But he loved us so much that he died so that he could take the victory from death. You see, in order to get the victory from death, you would have to have the power to resurrect yourself from the dead. Somebody hear what this preacher is saying. So he couldn't just redeem man. He had to redeem the firstborn. He had to redeem the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And Jesus came and said, I give my life. No man take my life. Death didn't even have the power to take it. Jesus gave it. And death was upset because many times death tried to take Jesus. This angel tried to take Jesus. He couldn't take Jesus. He tried to take him when he was in a crowd. He tried to take him everywhere he would and he couldn't take him. And Jesus said, no, I'm laying my own life down. And even when he was on the cross being beaten, when he was on the cross with, with, with the tree pressing against his back, when they planted the thorns on him, when they whipped him and plucked out his beard, death couldn't take him. Jesus had to give up his life. He gave his life. He said, nobody take this from me. I give up my life. I got power to lay it down, and I have power to take it back up. And death hated that. And the book of Corinthians said, if the princes of this world had known who they were crucified, they would not have crucified the Son of Glory. And death and hell and Satan began to rejoice and praise because they thought that they had conquered the Son of God. But God loved us so much. He loved us so much that he came and he died. He laid down his life and he took it back up. So you think God don't love you because you had to live and see terrible things? You think God don't love you because your life ain't turned out the way you thought it should? You should walk in holiness. You should fear God and serve God. He loves you so much that he died and he rose again so that we can raise again ourselves. That is the power over death. We are laying our life down, but because we laying it down in Christ, at the time that he calls us back, we're going to take our life back up. For God so loved the world. We're too busy judging God by the material things. When the scripture plainly said, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Book of James said, go to now you to say today or tomorrow, we'll go to such a city and buy and sell and get gain and continue year. He said, where's you ought to say if the Lord will, we'll do this. We misjudging the love of God. We trying to judge the love of God by the standards of man and you cannot do that. Man has feigned love. Man has fake love. Man has tainted love, but the love of God is untainted and he loves you in spite of, and I'm going to show it to you in a minute. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. He loved you in spite of them. Those children of Israel, when he had them kill the sacrifice lamb, they weren't all living right. That's the reason he had them put the blood up. Because he said, my death angel coming through, and he ain't going to tolerate y'all. 
Because the truth of the matter is, there was no difference between those Jews and those Egyptians. They all was living their own way. They all was disobeying the word of God. So God said, but when I see the blood, hallelujah, I'll pass over you. And so what God did, because we all running around talking about we God's children. We all running around talking about we love God. And we just keep doing the same thing over and over. God sent his son to die on the cross to shed his blood. I want to show y'all something powerful. His blood washed away your sins. It didn't cover your sin. It washed it away. It gave you power to be free from the enemy of sin and death. That's love. Adam lost it. And we were perishing. And because Adam lost it, the only thing everybody had to look forward to was death. And no matter how many times death happened, we never got comfortable with it. That's the reason we grieve. That's the reason we mourn. That's the reason we break down because we're not comfortable with death. Because God had made us from the beginning to live forever. And now death is coming out and destroying our hopes and destroying our dreams. But God so loved the world that he gave. And he died. And if we die in him, he will resurrect us. Jesus, I'll never forget your love. How dare me walk around mad because all I got is a dime in my pocket when you died that I might have a right to the tree of life. How dare me judge your love by the material things that I have or do not have when you gave me something greater than money, something greater than home, something greater than riches, something greater than fame. You gave me another opportunity of life for God so loved the world. I'll never forget what God done for me. And you shouldn't. But we do. Soon as a prayer don't get answered, we start complaining. Soon as something don't go the way we want to, we get upset. I hear people say all the time, I'm mad at God. How dare you disdain yourself to stand there in the presence of holiness and to say that you mad at God. If God should care that you was even mad from the beginning. How dare you who don't even hold life in your own body. How dare you that need God to wake you up every morning. How dare you that cannot take a step except the presence of God be with you. How dare you voice that you mad at God. Who are you? Job stood there speaking, calling himself mad at God. And when God began to speak to him, Job said, once have I spoken, but I will not speak again. No, I'm not mad at God. I'm glad for the love that he gave me. And if I messed up something by my own foolishness, that's on me. But I'll never forget the love that God gave us. His love bought the blood. Let me tell you something else in love bought. His love bought the grace. And let me show y'all something about grace. Go to Exodus, the 33rd chapter. Can y'all stick with me for a little bit? I want to show you this. Exodus, the 33rd chapter, verses 12 through 23. Exodus, his love bought grace. Because you see, hallelujah. I'm going to show you something else in a second. His, if it had not been for the grace of God, nothing would have worked. Because we didn't do anything. Y'all catch this. I want y'all to hear this. We didn't do anything to warrant or deserve God's love. Watch this here. Let me show you what he told Moses. Exodus the 33rd chapter. And you got to remember that Moses was in the same situation that we were in. Enoch that walked with God and was not because God took him was in the same situation that we were in. Noah who built the ark to save mankind from the flood was in the same situation we were in. And that situation was that Adam lost us into sin. And we didn't have anything that warned God to do anything for us. Exodus 33, watch this here, verses 12 through 23, hallelujah. I was reading this earlier, I just thought about how great my God was. Watch this here. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wast send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. Thou hast also found grace in thy sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For where shall it be known here that I and the people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? Shall we be separated, I and the people, from all the people that are found on the face of the earth? 
when the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Oh, hallelujah and praise to God. Watch this. I'm going to turn around in a minute. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I'm going to make thee, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And he said, Behold, there is a place by me, and, and there shalt thou stand up on the rock. And it shall come to pass, when, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand, and I will pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back part, but my face shall not be seen. Let me show you the grace of God. Watch this here. Here this man Moses. He, he, he talked to God in the burning bush. He went in the cloud. He talked to God face to face as a man talked with a man, but he never saw the face of God. Because God just showed him, you can't not look up on my face. Moses? Because you're not holy enough. Moses came out of sin just like the same sin that Adam fell into. Not only did God love us, but in love bought grace. And the grace of God was simply this. The grace of God was, Moses, you have done nothing worthy of me choosing you as a vessel. But because I'm gracious to mankind, because I'm gracious to the seed of Adam, because I'm gracious to the humankind, I will find me a vessel. I will choose you to deliver my people out of their bondage. Even though they worshiping idols, even though they committing adultery, even though they idolaters, even though they bad. By this, even though they liars, my grace. God love about grace. God love about grace. The book of Romans said, There was none righteous, no, not one. There was none that understood, there was none that was seeking after God. We weren't looking for God, God came looking for us. Noah didn't come to God and say, God, do this, destroy the world, and I'll build a boat. God came to Noah. Enoch did not come to God and say, God, take me out of the sinful world. I'll serve you forever. God came to Enoch. David didn't come to God. God came to David. We didn't come to God. God came to us. He was gracious. We wasn't doing anything impressive. Remember what I told you from 2 Chronicles, the 16th chapter and the 9th verse? It said, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to prove himself stronger than the heart of those who are perfect towards him. God is constantly watching us to find a servant that loves him enough that he can use him to save others. That's the grace of God. We haven't done anything to warrant this goodness of God. We didn't do anything to warrant that he would die on the cross. But God's love bought Grace. He loved mankind so much he was just gracious to him. And here he comes to know, I mean to Moses. He said, Moses, I know you by name. There we go again, talking about that friend thing. God made us a friend. God began to know us by name. Let me say, preacher, what's the importance of that? The importance of that is that God took time to find out who you were. Among 7 billion people in the earth. At the time of Noah, the world was probably, probably populated about 10 million people. And God took time to find out who Noah was. Grace. Grace. And you think God ain't answering your prayers. Some of your prayers don't get answered because you ask them amiss. Some of your prayers don't get answered because they have nothing to do with the glory of God. Y'all better understand what I'm saying. And that's God being good towards you. Grace. Grace. Why in the world he ever chose me to be a man of God? Why he ever put in me to be a minister? It wasn't because I was doing something that was so significant that he noted me above everybody else because there was nothing that I was doing. But he was so gracious. He knew my family needed saving. He was so gracious. He knew your family needed saving. He was so gracious that he decided to give us an opportunity to find him for God so loved. Well, y'all listen to the preacher. Sometimes we get this thing backwards. We act like God owes us something. God don't owe us nothing. And yet he paid everything. God is not in debt to us. We are in debt to him. God committed no sin. We sinned against him. It was Adam that sinned, not God. God kept his part of the covenant that he made with Adam. His love bought blood. His love bought grace. Ephesians 2, 9 says, for by grace 
or you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Your salvation is simply because of grace. Hallelujah. Let me show you one more thing on grace, then I'm going to move on to something that's love about. So go to Romans real quickly. I hope this is helping you out. Yeah. See, a lot of folks are giving up on God, and we, 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 we trying to... We're trying to trick God. Or we're trying to use gimmicks to get close to God. The book of James simply said, if you draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. That's the, that's the secret to getting close to God. It ain't no secret. The simple thing is, if you want to get close to God, get close to him. The closer you get to God, the closer he'll get to you. Why did he call Abraham friend? Why did he tell Moses, I know you by name? Why did he take Enoch up? Why did he choose Noah to build the ark? Because they were getting close to God. Grace. And the closer you get to God, the more you want to walk holy, the more you want to walk upright, the closer God will get to you. But we're playing this game. We're trying to be holy on church night. We're trying to be holy during holiday season. But we're not trying to be holy always. And God sees that. And he knows we're not sincere. He said, I'm looking for somebody whose heart is perfect towards me. Go to Romans real quickly. I got, I got to do this because I got to show you one more thing. And then I'm going to get out your hair. And I do thank you for your patience there. Romans, the fifth chapter, if you will. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Romans, the fifth chapter, uh, verses 20 through 21 is what we're going to look at first. I'm going to skip through this Romans real quickly. I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures. There. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 20 through 21. Watch this here. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound, but where sin abound, Grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life of Jesus Christ the Lord. And this is powerful. I was reading it. I said, well, I don't think we realize how powerful this is. Watch this here. So the law came, and the law taught people that they were sinners. The law couldn't redeem them. It just taught them that they were sinners. That's the reason they were often sacrificed, because they had to tone themselves. But because the law abounded more, the more sin reigned, the greater grace God. Y'all not catching what I'm saying. God's grace kept getting greater than sin. So even though Adam disobeyed God, the grace of God was greater than sin. If it was not, God would not have made a sacrifice from Adam from the beginning of the world. If it were not, he would have never had Abel born to represent the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So every time man sinned, God's grace automatically got greater than they sin. I hope y'all catch up what I'm saying. That's the reason that he provided salvation. So every time you lied, every time you stole, every time you fornicated, every time you idolated, every time you broke the commandments of God, his grace showed up greater than your sins. And if that ain't love, hallelujah. Now I got to think about my own self. How great was his grace to suffice a life like mine that he would call me into his ministry after the filthy things I did, after the evil things I said. And he said, the more that sin reigned, the greater grace got. And sin reigned unto death, so God said, grace gonna reign unto life everlasting. And this is the good thing, watch this here. Grace is gonna last even after he re resurrected us, even after we get in his kingdom, because let me show you something. You know how you are when you forgive somebody and then you can be forgiving them and you on your way and then one day you looking at them and you reminded of what they did and you get an attitude toward them. Anybody ever been there? Yes, we have. Well, God's grace is going to reign past that so that one day he don't look at us in the kingdom and remember how we transgress against him. Tell me that ain't love. Jesus, I'll never forget what you done for me. Watch this here. Watch this here. Woo. When God showed me this, I thought, I thank you, God. Because I'm still working. And I'm like James Cleveland said, just be patient with me. God ain't done with me yet. I'm so glad that his grace is greater than my sin. Now, watch what he said in the sixth chapter. What? Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So no, he don't want you to continue sinning just so that you can get his grace. His grace is there. And it's always greater than sin 
so that his love can always redeem us. His love bought grace. Hallelujah. Watch verse 20 through uh, 23. Watch this here. For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things where you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now I'm being made free from sin and become servant of God. You have your fruit unto holiness in the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me show you something about grace. The price for sin. Adam didn't. He wasn't a pedophile. He wasn't a serial killer. He wasn't even a murderer. He wasn't a liar. He wasn't a backbiter. He was simply disobedient. Because of that, the Lamb of God had to take away the sin. It didn't say sins. It said the sin of the world and the sin of the world was disobedient. That's grace. There was nothing that Adam did that even warranted God to want to take away the sin of the world. Because he had already trans God, but his grace, his grace. God said, I'm a redeemer. So he bought the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Somebody give God some praise. Watch this here. His love bought mercy. His love bought mercy. So his love, his love brought our salvation because he loved us so much. His love bought the blood that covered our sins and washed away our sins. His love bought grace that God did it just because. Nothing that we did that even warranted him to do it. Adam wasn't doing anything to even give God an idea of changing his mind. It was just the grace of God. His love bought mercy. Hallelujah. Watch this. Here. Go to Titus, the third chapter. Verses 1 through 11. Titus, the third chapter, verses 1 through 11. I'm almost done here. If y'all can just bear with me, I'm going to show you this and get out your way. Y'all continue to pray for me as I'm praying for you. So good to see so many of you on there, and I hope that I'm being a blessing to you. Titus, the third chapter, watch this here. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities, to powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness and all men. For we ourselves, watch the third verse, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. But after that, hallelujah, but after that, the kindness of love of our God of, of the love of God our Savior toward man appear, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, these things I will, that affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works, that these things are good and proper unto men. But avoid foolish questions, and denialty, and contention, and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic also after the first and second act magician reject, knowing that he that is such subverted and sinned and been condemned himself. Watch this here. He talked about, remember how we all, because sometimes people just think that they're better than others. But God says something. He said, you all were sometimes foolish. You know the word foolish means to be doubtful towards God, not to believe in God. You all were sometimes foolish. You all were disobedient. We all was. Abraham was. Adam was. Enoch was. We all was. Job was. David was. Your mama was. My mama was. Your daddy. My daddy. Grandparents. But I know you said, no, my grandmama was a saint. She was once foolish towards God, disobedient. That's the reason he sought grace. And then he bought mercy. After that, the kindness and the love of God. Let me show you something about love. God bought kindness too. Because he could have still loved you and not been kind. You ever seen somebody that loved you, but they're just so mean towards you? God not only loved us, but he was kind towards us. He was kind in the fact that he redeemed us and bought his grace and his mercy. His love bought mercy. Psalms 136, if you will. And then I got one more top, one more thing I'm going to show you, and I'm going to be done with it. Psalms 136. Show you the mercy that he bought. Hallelujah. Jesus, I'll never forget. 
See, that's the reason I'm staying in God, folks. I'm not, I'm not finding reasons not to serve God. I'm not finding reasons to be mad at God. I listen to a lot of people. Sometimes it's like you're trying to find a reason not to serve God. I'm not looking for a reason not to serve God. I got every reason in the world to serve him to the day that I die. I've given him these years of my life as I've been in this ministry, and I'm going to give him some more. They haven't always been great years. They haven't always been upright years. But I'm not looking for any reason to find a problem with God. Some people look for a reason to find a problem with God, not me. And as long as you're looking for a reason, the devil going to provide you with one. I have nothing in my heart against God. Y'all hear what this preacher say? You mad at God because breakfast wasn't ready. You mad at God because the marriage didn't work. You mad at God because the job ain't. Well, I ain't mad at him about nothing. I'm like Joe. If he were to slay me, I would serve him because he's been so good to me. Hallelujah. Why am I sick? You mad at God because you're sick. You mad at God because you're well. Mad at God because you're broke. Mad at God because you're rich. You mad at God because of this. I'm not mad. Watch this here. Psalm 136. Watch what it said here. Verses 1. It said this. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto God of God for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of Lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him alone that doeth great wonders, for his work, his mercy endureth forever. To him by wisdom made the heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great light, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. What is this writer talking about? He's talking about the creation of God. He's talking about his mercy endureth forever, because his mercy is good. Because even when Adam fell, he was so merciful, he told the sun, still come up. He told the moon, come out. He told the rain, fall. He told the wind, blow. He told the grass, grow. That's mercy. Because <clears throat> he made all these things for man. But when man fell, he didn't take them away. That mercy. His love bought mercy. Somebody here to preach it. Hallelujah. Let me show you the last point I want to show you. And this is it. Hallelujah. And I, I, Watch this here. He loved us first. I said that earlier. God loved us first. Before you was ever born, God loved us. Watch this here. Go to 1 John not the Gospel of John, but First John, the fourth chapter. All the way towards the end there, right before Revelation. First John, the fourth chapter, verses 19. Let's hear what the book says. See, the problem is, say, we got to get back to the Word of God. We got to stop listening to these proper liars, these test of liars. Stop listening to these motivational speakers. Stop listening to these preachers trying to show you how to get rich. Stop listening to all that mess, because they're messing you up in the head. And start listening to the gospel of love. Start listening to the salvation. Start looking to the fact that God is redeeming you from your sin. Stop listening to these people that say it's okay to be this, it's okay to be that. And listen to the word of God. That's where you're going to find the love of God. Search the scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you will not come to me. Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. True love is telling people the truth. True love is telling people that you ain't going to get into God's kingdom living like that. True love is telling people that what you're doing is wrong. That's love. And that's what God did towards us. 1 John 4th chapter. Hallelujah. Verse 19. Here we go. Here, here it says right here. Let me read 18 and 19. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feared is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. And the only reason we love God, we didn't know who God was. We didn't know what God was. And it was God that loved us first. Because who went to the cross to die? When did you come repent? When he went to the cross, 
or before he went to the cross. He loved you first. Hallelujah. <clears throat> he loved you first. And when you were born in this world, you didn't have mom and daddy to tell you about the Bible. They was reading it to you. God started calling you. He loved us first. You wanted to be a policeman, a fireman, a doctor, a lawyer, a pilot, astronaut. Nobody ever grew up as a kid saying, I want to be an apostle. I want to be a disciple. I want to be a servant of the most high God. No kid ever tells you that. No, they don't. You know they don't. Your children now won't even tell you, what you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a mechanic. I want to be an engineer. I want to be an architect. Ain't none of them saying, I want to be a disciple of the Lord. I want to suffer for his name's sake. He loved us first. And if you would ask me, I would have never told you I wanted to be a preacher. I didn't even know what a preacher was. But God called me. I'm going to show this to you. I'm going to close out with this. Go to Romans, the fifth chapter, if you will. I'm going to close out with this. I thank you all for joining. Hallelujah. Romans 5. God called me while I was yet in my sins. He didn't call me when I went to church. He didn't call me when I picked up the Bible. He didn't call me when I was lining people up and down the street preaching to them. He didn't call me. He didn't call me when I was praying. He called me when I was fighting. He called me when I was cussing. He called me when I was lying. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. Watch this here. Romans the fifth chapter. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home. Verses one through eight. Therefore, <clears throat> being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into his grace when we stand and rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation, also known that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man will some even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ didn't die when the whole world repented. Christ didn't die when we came together in prayer service. Christ died while they were calling him a liar. Christ died while they stood at the cross and said he called himself the son of God and would be the son of God and make himself come down. Christ died while the thieves on the cross were casting the same thing and they said Christ died while the Romans and the Jews were standing at the foot of the cross hating him. Christ died after they beat him, after they hung him on the cross. He died while they were committing homosexuality. He died while they were committing fornication and adultery. He died while they were murdering, while they were thieving, while they were idolating. That's when he died. I'll never forget. Never forget what God, love, has done for me. So, I'm telling y'all this for real. This ain't the time to give up on serving God. This ain't the time to be sitting back in your corner in the home questioning what God did. This ain't the time to say you wasted your time because God so loved you. Not a, there's many more things I want to tell you, but time will fail me. Not only did his love bring all those things, his love bought Hallelujah. Salvation. His love bought rewards. His love bought back eternal life that Adam lost. I love the Lord. That's the reason I'm going to keep on going and keep on telling you to the day that he called me home. I'm going to keep telling you this. And you jump on here from time to time and hear me if you want to. Or you can say I'm, I'm extremist if you want to. You can say I'm doing too much or it ain't that serious. You do whatever you want to do. I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to stop being fooled by all of these false prophets and false teachers that's out there trying to teach you how to get rich. That ain't how God showed you his love. He showed you his love through his blood, through his death. And he'll take care of you and he'll keep you. David said, I was young, but now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed big and bread. God got you. And he'll never forsake you. 
You may be perplexed, but you won't be forsaken. You may be persecuted, but you won't be forsaken. You may be forgotten by the world, but you will not be forsaken. And Jesus says something. He said, everybody that confesses me before man, I will confess him before my father in the presence of the holy angel. One day when we lay down this robe of flesh and God calls all from the grave, they have done good unto the resurrection of life and they have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. One day, Jesus is going to say your name in the presence of holy angels. For God so loved the world. I'll never forget. I thank you all for joining me. Y'all continue to pray for me. Pray for my family, uh, my children, grandchildren, my sibling. I pray for salvation, my dad. Uh, I pray for salvation. I want to see my friends and my loved ones saved. I want to see them healed. I want to see them walking in the power of God. We don't have long. We don't have long. Look at the signs, folks. See the signs. This is not the time to be deflecting from God. Hallelujah. Love each and every one of you. I saw some names popped on there. I was very happy to see. So God bless you all. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Until we meet again next time, this is Ella Foster coming to you live from Maricopa, Arizona. Until we meet again, may God bless you and keep you. Amen.